Well, thanks, Vinny. Um, we're working on the IT stuff at the moment, um, but I'll get started. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I can't tell you how important the Crisis Center feels at connecting with a business community, uh, how valuable that is. You know, most of the time when we think about the Crisis Center in, in, in our community and all the work we do, and we're one of the larger nonprofit organizations. We serve uh, thousands, hundreds, 150,000 or more people every year. The problem is most people don't know about us until they need us. So I wanted to share with you some of the things that we see as strengths and how those relate to that entrepreneurial spirit. And you want to get like this little guy up here. Yeah, I got it working. It's going, you know, I got it going on. Um, you know, you're a very creative group of people. You're very engaged with things. So is there any downside to that? Well, there could be. And we'll get to that. Where's your strength come from? Creativity. And where's creativity happen? It happens in the brain, right? And not so much like this picture shows, it's not all happening in the right brain. It's happening in the left and right communicating with each other and working together. So that creative stuff that goes on, yeah, they sort of say there's something going on in the right brain for creativity, but you know, without the left brain and the math and the music and the patterns and all those kind of things that the left brain does, the right brain wouldn't be able to do anything with its creative thoughts. So you know, creativity is a source of great strength for humans. In fact, it's what got human beings to be on the top of the food chain in this planet. Of course, there's the upside and the downside. Creativity has done wonderful things for us. It's created the internet and computers and all of that kind of information technology. It's also created bigger bombs than we could have ever imagined. It's created tons of imaginable ways to use fossil fuel motors, right? Um, in my neighborhood on the weekend, there is always a leaf blower going somewhere. And, you know, we went for decades and decades just raking and sweeping our leaves, right? But no, now we got to blow them with a fossil fuel engine. So we have impacted the ecology of this whole planet with our creative thinking. We're pretty powerful. So let's see what ways we can really use that creativity for something that's helpful. So, oh, by the way, at any point, if you got a question, and I've got some bright lights on me here, raise your hand or make a motion, and I'll, I'll give you a shout. Um, so when people, human beings, are doing creative thinking, the mind is working at its optimal. That's the best processing it can do. It's like your computer right after you ran a virus scan and wow it's running faster and working great right creativity does that because it uses all kinds of parts of the brain at the same time it doesn't use just one part you know when they do brain scans of people who are feeling depressed and maybe even in counseling or therapy for depression and when someone's really having a bad day and they take a brain scan, they find one area pretty much in the center of the brain that's all lit up and really active. They don't see much happening anywhere else. When they do a brain scan of somebody drawing, playing the guitar or something, they see elements of the brain lit up all over. Maybe not so much in any one area, but many of them connected together. So it's kind of like exercise, right? It's great to go out and, you know, take a 30-minute walk every day. But what we now know is much better is to do some forms of cross-training where you're lifting weight, where you're doing balance things, where you're using all kinds of different muscle groups. Then your health is going to be improved. So same thing with the brain. The brain does lots of functions, but creative thinking is its best optimal way to work. So that's how we invent. That's how we problem-solve. And that's how we cope. Really important things for human beings. It's how we figured out how to hunt wild animals eons ago, how we figured out how to work together to do those things, 
how we figured out how to grow food instead of having to hunt and gather for it all the time. So it's made huge changes for the human race. Um, it also promotes that positive mental health. It's pretty hard to feel bad about yourself or life when you're doing something creative, innovative, making some new um, thing that's never existed before, that's unique. That gives people a lot of stimulation, a lot of recognition for themselves. You know, one of the things that's really difficult for the entrepreneur, if you're in a small business, if you're starting things up, is you may not have the kind of interaction that a bigger organization would have with more people on staff and maybe there's quite a while while you're working to launch a product or a service. How do you stay up and charged for that and ready to do those things? Well if nobody else is giving you a pat on the back sometimes you gotta give yourself a pat, right? And some way that happens is by doing creative things and seeing what you've accomplished with that creativity. Sometimes we need to be recognizing what we're doing ourselves and what's making a difference. Um, it can be a long task. It can be one that is isolating if you're the CEO and you're the CFO and the COO and you know how many other people know all the tasks that you're doing at once. So one of the things we know is that people need to get that recognition. They can get it by keeping track of what they're doing. And a real simple thing that um, has been used for many people with depression, and bipolar disorder, and the average person who is maybe not as fully connected or not as connected to as many people because of the nature of their work, is a simple activity called what went well. And the idea of that is each night before going to sleep, you have a piece of paper and you have three lines. And on the first one, you put down what went well today. You know, I talked at Gasparilla Interactive and, you know, it went well because nobody threw rotten fruit at me. And that wasn't one of my what wells, what went wells today, maybe. So just three simple things like that. And there's, there are little things. Maybe you made it through traffic today. Um, you know, I got down here and I was a little concerned on my way. I thought, you know, is there going to be a lot of traffic or no parking because Hillary Clinton is speaking a couple blocks away? Um, but no, it wasn't a big deal. But what went well is a great activity because it keeps the mind focused on things that went well, those positive things. You know, with that in mind, that means what you're doing at the end of every day is thinking about what you achieved that day. That's a positive frame of mind. You know, we always hear people talking about is the glass half full or the glass half empty? What's your perspective on life? The what, the what went well activity is a great way to help remind yourself of what's working and what you've accomplished and what you've got done. What they found out for people doing that activity was after about three weeks of that, their attitude about life was changing. They changed from a glass half empty to a glass half full person. So we have ways that we can impact our creativity and make it use for us instead of against us. Now, one of the things that's happening in the brain is all those neural pathways. We have all these connections, and the brain is very plastic. It changes. Um, for the young human up to about age seven, pretty much what the brain is doing is making tons and tons of connections about stuff in their environment to assess whether this is a threat, whether this is good to eat, whether this makes me sleepy, happy, tired, whatever. By about age seven, the brain does an incredible thing. It starts cutting off a lot of those memories because it's figured out what works and what doesn't. Um, uh, over the holidays last year, I was in Wisconsin with relatives and my niece has two young little boys. One's uh, just about three years old and uh, we were at my brother's house and they have this sort of back room, computers in there, all this stuff on shelves. And there was this odd sort of 
three-quarter size puppet of Pee Wee Herman. I don't know why they had it, I never asked her anything, but my little great nephew opens the door, he looks in there and he goes, scary guy. So his brain was working on his environment, what do I need to be scared of, what do I need to worry about, what's new, what's different, what's going on, and he saved that. By the time he's seven or eight, he's going to cut that loose and totally cut those networks off. You have done the same thing with your neural pathways. If you ever moved and lived in one place or other places, do you ever have that experience where maybe you've been in a place only a month or so, you leave work and you find yourself driving to your old residence? You go, oh wait, I don't live there anymore, what am I doing going this way? We made a neural pathway to what's my route home. And then we've got to create a new one, and we've got to do that long enough that we forget about that other one we're not using and don't need. So neural pathways are really important. They're like branches of a tree. There's tons of them. The problem is we have a lot of um, ancient brain processes about flight or fight or fear that basic parts of the brain register information, and they keep that. And that information creates neural pathways that jump to the forefront whenever they get triggered or remembered. And those are some of the things that can, can kind of get in the way of things that happen. Um, you know, you talk to somebody who's been married three times and divorced three times, they may be a little hesitant to go out on a blind date, right? You know, they got some neural pathways built up too, not so successful in that area. Um, the cool thing is we can change those neural pathways. What went well, activity, starts changing neural pathways. It starts creating a new pathway, a new series of connections in the brain. Those pathways are the things that connecting with the emotions we feel when they happen really build something powerful for us. They are things that allow us to create a new kind of thought pattern and use that to apply to different situations. In fact, um, you know, this is Gasparilla Interactive. So let's do something interactive. Okay, let's create some new neural pathways for you. How would you like to rearrange your brain pathways this afternoon, huh? Okay, this is a partner activity. You don't have to do it, but I'll tell you what, you're gonna have a lot more fun if you do. So. Um, I'm going to count to five. When I get to five, you need to be standing up facing a partner and you need to ask and figure out whose birthday comes earlier in the calendar year. You know, a January birthday comes before a March birthday and, and then I'll tell you what the next directions are, okay? One, find a partner. Two, stand up. Three, find out whose birthday comes first. Four, great, looks like most people have a partner. Three people can work together and take turns. Okay, great. The person whose birthday comes later in the year gets to go first. And this is the mirror exercise. So you'll need your hands free to do this, okay? The person whose birthday comes later is gonna put their hands up like they're touching a mirror. Their partner is going to put their hands up close but not touching theirs. The person whose birthday comes later is going to be thinking about moving in that physical plane at head and shoulder level, at torso level, and at knee level. And your partner is going to be your mirror and try to follow. Now, you're not going so fast it's impossible, but they don't know where you're going, so they got to focus and pay attention. Go. Okay. I knew this group would be very creative. Nice job. Okay, give yourself some snaps. That's what I tell them in the high school, right? Okay, now, second phase, the other person gets to lead, but if your partner did that, you can't do it. You gotta do, if your partner went like that, you can't do it. You gotta do different kinds of motions in different places than your partner did. Go. Pretty easy the first time. But the second time, you really had to dig into your creative powers and come up with other ways to do that. Simple guideline, keeping your hands close to the person, staying in sort of one plane, but moving in all kinds of different ways. Now, there were a lot of people 
who didn't stick with that. They were going like this and doing stuff and you know, so they took it to another level, see if their partner could follow them. And there was no right or wrong with that activity. You just develop some neural pathways to an experience of being in tune with someone else, paying attention to someone with a movement activity. One of the things that they do in um, nursing facilities that have Alzheimer's and memory care units is they get the people there with those brain disorders up dancing with a partner to music. Think about it. The music part of the brain's engaged, the movement part, the relating to somebody else, the body parts that are moving in time to music. Lots of parts of the brain got to connect to do that. And of course the mantra in those facilities is use what you got left. If you're not using it, it's going to keep withering away. So one of the things that happens is that's similar to something else you've done before. Your brain tries to connect it to other activities to have put it in a similar category. You're categorizing, you're strategizing, you're using memory. Those are all high order thinking skills and that's really healthy for the brain because it requires lots of parts of the brain to be engaged. So the brain is kind of like the creative computer, right? Um, the brain is the physical organ and the mind is like the software or the processes. So, you know, unfortunately we have this term called mental illness and it's referring to the mind and that's something we can't put our hands on. That's the thoughts, the attitudes, you know, that, that's not something tangible. But the brain is where all that happens. That's the physical organ. And the brain is the most unique organ in the body. It has that plasticity. It can regrow new parts. It can rearrange functionality for certain areas. Certainly you've all seen um, a person with impaired vision going down the street with one of those canes uh, sweeping around and tapping. And if the visual part of the brain is not working and a person needs a lot more um, tactile and hearing processing, the brain just starts using some of that visual um, area that's not doing anything else for some of those processes. I don't know about you, but I've walked up to a lot of ATM machines and it has the braille on there. I've run my fingers over and I'm going, how can they tell anything from that? That takes a lot of practice, that develops a lot of neural pathways for that skill. So you've got a lot of neural pathways for the creative skills and the type of work that you're involved in. The problem is what happens when there's an injury to the brain? I know this is kind of a gruesome picture, but so we've got the red spot where maybe there was a bump or a concussion. Maybe the blue spot was, um, you know, some kind of uh, problem with blood flow and arteries collapsed and it was a stroke of some kind that happened. The brain, you know, again is unique even in its structure for other organs. Um, I heard recently a um, neurologist talking about the brain and he was saying, you know, within three or four hours after death, the brain pretty much turns into uh, uh, sort of like a milkshake consistency. The brain is already kind of like tofu or a soft-boiled egg. So no wonder there's all this issue about concussions these days. That, you know, if you took a soft-boiled egg, put it inside a jar and shook it around for a few minutes, what had happened to that egg? The brain's kind of like that in this skull shell that it's in. There's not much room to move. If we bump our heads, what ends up happening is the brain gets a bruise, but it's got no place to swell like we get a lump on our arm or something. So it collapses in on itself, it crushes some of those structures in there, some of those branches going to different parts.